It's loud enough. Yeah. I, I get a bit too loud, I'm given to understand, so I don't know who's controlling the volume. Imagine he is incredibly busy 
at the moment and has uh, in discussion with Jane um, by moving the agenda around and has been able to come along. So I do appreciate the fact that you've taken the time to come along. And with that, over to you, sir. Jane is going to do that for me, so I will have to uh, give Jane the thumbs up when we need to uh, advance forward on the slides. What my intention is to do, and I, I recognise I've been to full agenda, I have uh, 15 minutes, so I will seek to deliver this presentation within that time frame. The agenda I'm, I'm going to speak to you here, this is the format of the public consultation that we will deliver at the three public events that we're going to hold in relation to the uh, proposed merger of the Upton and West Kirby fire stations at Greensburg. What I'll also do is, uh, is, is talk in a, a little bit more detail about some of the other consultation events that we will hold in addition to the public meetings. In terms of the agenda then itself for the public consultation, will be an introduction to the consultation process, which is the next slide, so I'll cover that then. The, a, if you like, a detailing of the Merseyside Fire Rescue Authority's statutory duties to set some context, to outline the financial challenge that the authority has faced over the course of this spending review and that which it will face in the future, to explain the budget decisions taken, to, uh, taken by the authority thus far, to outline the merger's proposal, to talk in more detail about the Greensby specific proposal, and then at the end to take some questions. In terms of the consultation process, then, as I said previously, we'll have three public meetings, one will be held in Upton at the Underwood Church at the Wood Church High School. The consultation meeting in Greensby will be in the Greensby Methodist Church and then the West Kirby consultation will be in the, in the Highlight Community Centre. We'll also hold deliberative forums, stakeholder engagement events with the likes of the Chipwell Chamber of Commerce, that type of, uh, that type of audience and there will also be an online, indeed there is, and there has been since the 3rd of October, an online survey posted on the Mercy Fire website. And at the end of each event, we will ask people to fill out one of the survey forms, if they haven't done it already. I'll deliver the presentation, which is this. I'll then take questions. We'll have distributed the newsletter prior to the commencement of the meeting, and then we'll ask people to in terms of the uh, statutory duties for the Fire and Rescue Service, Fire and Rescue Services Act 2004 details a number of core functions. Section 6 is not up there, that is the, the duty to give fire safety advice. The, the statutory duties and the powers that relate to on the, the slide are specifically in relation to the response duties. Section 7 requires the authority to make provision for the response to fires. Section 8 is the road traffic collisions. Section 9 is emergencies, which will be the emergencies order 2007, are specified as emergencies involving chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, or conventional explosives, CBRNA, or hazardous material incidents or urban search and rescue incidents, that is rescues of persons from collapsed structures or serious transport incidents involving a train, a tram or an aircraft that would require an authority to deploy its assets beyond normal reasonably foreseeable circumstances. The authority also has powers under the Act, under Section 11, to respond to any eventuality which may cause a person or animal 
essentially, Jack, essentially, to either die, be injured, or become ill. The tissue you'll appreciate is pretty much everything else that isn't covered under the target duties under section 7, 8, and 9. The Fire and Rescue Service National Framework is published periodically by the government and that sets out the government's expectations of the Fire and Rescue Service in the context of the Fire and Rescue Services Act. And for those of you who are familiar with the Strategic Policing Framework, it holds the same legal status, if you like, as, as that particular uh, that particular piece of guidance. Fire and Rescue Authorities must have regard to the framework when they're carrying out the functions and the lift. Each Fire and Rescue Authority must produce an integrated risk management plan within which we must assess all foreseeable fire and rescue related emergencies, which pretty much covers everything on the previous slide. What we must also have due regard to is the Community Risk Register, which is produced by the Merseyside Resilience Forum, and that is a statutory duty placed on all what is known as Category 1 responders under the Civil Contingencies <coughs> Act. Examples of Category 1 responders is the Fire and Rescue Service, the Police, the Ambulance Service, the Local Authority, and certain other agencies. In terms of the, the financial challenge that the authority has had to deal with within this current spending review, the authority has seen a 35% government grant reduction in or over the four years of the spending review, which the final year we are in now, so 14 and 15 being the final year. 70% of the Fire Rescue Authority's income is received through the government grant. So the operational gearing between grant and council tax precept is 70-30. Council tax precept or precept rises have been limited through the excessiveness principles at 2%. So what that effectively does, given the fact that uh, Merseyside has a very low tax base, okay, so what that means is the majority of properties across Merseyside are in band A which is the lowest, uh, the lowest council tax threshold. <laughs> what that means is if you compare Merseyside to somewhere say like Buckinghamshire in the southeast of England where the majority of properties are banded in and above, you will see that a limitation of a 2% increase in Buckinghamshire has much less impact say than it would here on Merseyside. The India savings for 2015-16 which all of the mainstream parties have committed to equates to 10% of our overall grant funding, which will require the authority to make further savings in a year of 6.3 million. And that takes effect as of the 1st of April 2015, which means in practice we need to make the structural changes now in anticipation of our income reducing further in or on rather than the 1st of April 2015. The assumption is, and to be clear, this is the position of all of the mainstream political parties in relation to running the surplus by the end of the next parliament to effectively eradicating the structural deficit. So to be clear, every political party is committed to the same financial position. Our best case assumption is we will be required to make further savings in 1617 up to 9.1 million, rising to in the order of 20 million by the end of the next parliament. That is on top of the savings that's 20, which will be 26.5 million pounds of efficiency savings that we've made or we will make from that point. The point I need to make is. Since 2004, when the Fulman formula for the Fire and Rescue Service changed, to be clear, under the last administration, Merseyside has never had grant increases which have kept pace with, with inflation. Historically, we have always been the most expensive Fire and Rescue Service in the country. So for us, the financial challenge did not start in 2010. For us, it started back in 2004. 
when the funding formula changed to a per, a per capita, so per head of population based formula. And that is because prior to that, the Fire and Rescue Commission on Merseyside, for all intents and purposes, reflected what Merseyside looked like back in the 1950s, when Liverpool was the second city and Merseyside in general, the population was 1.7 million compared to the 1. or just under 1.4 million it is now. And you'll all be aware, back in the 1950s, Merseyside economically looked a lot different to what it does now, in, in particular in terms of rents. So, the budget decisions that the authority made at the budget meeting on the 27th of February this year was make the assumptions to set a balanced budget for February, or as of, sorry, April 1st, 2015 and beyond. The authority recognises that it's not possible to protect the front line. You have to make savings across all of the service. Our, our back office functions in total equate to our, our total spend, if you like, in terms of wages spent, so manageable income is less than 10 million. It is not, but there are certain functions you need to operate to be viable as a service like payroll, HR, legal, those sort of various sort of functions. You cannot function without that. Okay. We've assumed from the six point uh, six point five million pound savings in the year for fifteen sixteen that we will make just under half of that from non-operational response. So from not from fire stations and you like that's probably going to be a big stretch given what we've done up to this point. That will include the loss of at least 40 more non-uniform posts, so people who are not firefighters, on top of the posts that we lost already in the previous round of the deficiencies. It is very unlikely that we will avoid compulsory redundancies, and in doing that, I recognise that we are no different from where or for any of the other local authorities in that regard. The point that I do need to make is that this is likely to have, and in truth does have now, a significant impact on the organisational capacity. It is not just about our, our fire stations, clearly there is a, a substantial infrastructure that sits behind that to support it. In terms of the budget decisions then, we say we're going to take three, just under three million from support services, the balance then clearly has to come from ops response simply because there's nowhere else to take it from. We're assuming uh, 3.4 million pounds of savings or expressed another way in another 100 firefighter posts because that is what that equates to. At the end, it comes down to firefighter numbers and quite simply the number of firefighters we have that we have rather determines the number of fire engines we can staff, therefore the number of stations which we can keep open. Accepting that the stations to a greater or lesser extent are a garage. I appreciate that there is a significant public attachment in some places to fire stations. We're seeing that now in, uh, in Allerton, which is one of the stations in Liverpool, which we're there about the closure, features in the Beatles song Penny Lane. But there's a, that there, is a, there is an emotional attachment there which, which you, we, you just cannot get away from, however illogical that may be. As I've said, what that means, we, we need to, we simply will not have, we, we will not have enough fire engines to justify keeping all the fire stations on. It is that simple. In terms of appliances, we will seek to maintain the 28 that we have now. At the beginning of the spending review, we had 42. At least we're down to 28 now. This will take it down to 24 whole time and four whole time retained. That is, the whole time firefighters making themselves available on their days off on a 30 minute recall to come in and crew the four fire engines that would be subject to the merger proposals or the outright closures in the, in the case of Liverpool. What we may need to do in order to ensure the availability of those appliances is to recruit community retained firefighters. I do not have the time at this point to explain in detail the difference between community retained and whole time. Other than to say, whole time firefighters, it is their job, 42 hours a week, that is what they do. A retained firefighter, 
the contact time for the 120 hour retained contract is about three hours a week. You can see there that there's going to be a significant difference in terms of the skills and competencies that you can achieve with a whole time firefighter nurse who's been retained. Prior to where the authority set the budget and in the consultation in relation to our integrated risk management plan, my professional recommendation to the authority was that there were four options broadly that they could consider. Outlet station closures, station mergers, which to be clear is the same thing as an outright station closure, but you would just build a new station. If you close to you build a new station in between the equidistant if you like to the previous two. Days only crewing, okay, we just crew a fire engine of the day, because strategically you could do that at certain locations. And again, I don't have the time now to explain our operation response methodology, but it is something we could do, because it would give us capacity around training and community safety and so forth. And then finally, community retained, which is an operation across large swathes of the country, to, to be clear about that. Merseyside is one of only three fire and rescue services that don't have any community retained. London and the West Midlands are the other two, so two big metropolitan areas. From the public consultation, how come station mergers was, the, or was deemed as the most reasonable uh, by some margin and truth? Followed by outright closures, people recognised that there was a, given the number of stations we have in the job at the university side, they recognised we could still make very fast response times, even if we were to close some stations. In terms of the mergers themselves, identified three feasible merger options. Closure of Upton, closure of West Kirby, new station at Greasby, Closure of Heighton, closure of Wiston, new station of Prescott, closure of Eccleston, and the closure of the existing St. Helens, effectively town centre station, albeit it's in the Par Ward. For those of you who know St. Helens, and the new station in the town centre. In Liverpool, as I said previously, the proposal is the outright closure of Allen Fire Station, and we commence public consultation on that proposal as of the 1st of November. All of the mergers or closures clearly will be subject to a 12 week consultation process and thereafter we will take individual reports back to the Fire Rescue Authority for them to consider the view.